Countdown to Halloween 2022, featuring eerie and uncanny tales of haunts, ghosts, and suspense. The first Monday of every month, at exactly midnight, a new story will appear on StoryLink Radio's YouTube channel as we count down to Halloween 2022. Plan to catch these each month or you'll miss one. Each story will be 13 to 30 minutes long. And now, tonight's story from StoryLink Radio. The Tarn by Hugh Walpole. As Foster moved unconsciously across the room, he bent towards a bookcase and stood leaning forward just a little, choosing now one book, now another with his eye. His host, seeing the muscles of the back of his thin, scraggy neck stand out above his low flannel collar, thought of the ease with which he could squeeze that throat and the pleasure, the triumphant, lustful pleasure that such an action would give him. The low, white-walled, white-ceilinged room was flooded with the mellow, kindly Lakeland sun. October is a wonderful month in the English lakes, golden, rich, and perfumed. Slow suns moving through apricot-tinted skies to ruby evening glories. The shadows lie then thick about that beautiful country, in dark purple patches and long web-like patterns of silver gauze and thick splotches of amber and gray. The clouds pass in galleons across the mountains, now veiling, now revealing, now descending with ghost-like armies to the very breast of the plains, suddenly rising to the softest of blue skies and lying thin in lazy, languorous color. Fenwick's cottage looked across to low fells. On his right, seen through his side window, sprawled the hills above Oswater. Fenwick looked at Foster's back and felt suddenly sick so that he sat down, veiling his eyes for a moment with his hand. Foster had come up there, come all the way from London, to explain to him, to want to put things right. For how many years had he known Foster? <laughs> Why, for, for twenty years at least. And during all those years, Foster had been forever determined to <laughs> put things right with everybody. He could not bear to be disliked. He hated that anyone would think ill of him. He wanted everyone to be his friend. That was one reason, perhaps, why Foster had gone on so well, had prospered so in his career. One reason, too, why Fenwick had not. For Fenwick was the opposite of Foster in this. He did not want friends. He certainly did not care that people should like him. That is, people for whom, for one reason or another, he had contempt. And, well... He had contempt for quite a number of people, didn't he? Fenwick looked at that long, thin, bending back and felt his knees tremble. Soon Foster would turn round and that high, reedy voice would pipe out something about the books. What jolly books you have, Fenwick! Hmm. How many, many times in the long watches of the night when Fenwick could not sleep had he heard that pipe sounding so close there. Yes. Yes, in the very shadows of his bed. And how many times had Fenwick replied to it, I hate you. You are the cause of my failure in life. You have been in my way always, always, always. Patronizing and pretending and in truth showing others what a poor thing you thought me. How great a failure. How conceited a fool. Oh, I know, I know. You can hide nothing from me. I can hear you. Indeed, for twenty years now, Foster had been persistently in Fenwick's way. There had been that affair, so long ago now, when Robbins had wanted a sub-editor for his wonderful review, The Parthenon, and Fenwick had gone to see him, and they had had a splendid talk. Uh, how magnificently Fenwick had talked that day, with what enthusiasm he had shown Robbins, who was blinded by his own conceit anyway, the kind of paper that the Parthenon might be. How Robbins had caught his own enthusiasm, how he had pushed his fat body about the room, crying, Yes, yes, Fenwick, that's fine, that's fine indeed, paw, paw. Yes, 
And then how after all Foster had got that job. Oh, the paper had only lived for a year or so, it is true. But the connection with it had brought Foster into prominence just as it might have brought Fenwick. And then five years later there was Fenwick's novel, The Bitter Aloe, the novel upon which he had spent three years of blood and tears endeavor. And then in the very same week of publication, Foster brings out The Circus, the novel that made his name, although heaven knows the thing was poor sentimental trash. Uh, you may say that one novel cannot kill another, uh, but can it not? Had not the circus appeared, would not that group of London know-alls, that conceited, limited, ignorant, self-satisfied crowd who nevertheless could do by their talk so much to affect a book's good or evil fortunes, yes, I would have talked about the bitter aloe and so forced it into prominence. As it was, the book was stillborn, and the circus went on its prancing, triumphant way. After that, there had been many occasions, some small, some big, and always in one way or another that thin, scraggy body of Foster's was interfering with Fenwick's happiness. The thing had become, of course, an obsession with Fenwick, hiding up there in the heart of the lakes with no friends, almost no company, very little money. He was given too much to brooding over his failure. He was a failure, and it was not his own fault. How could it be his own fault with his talents and his brilliance? It was a fault of modern life, that is, a lack of culture, a fault of the stupid material mess that made up the intelligence of human beings, and the fault of Foster. Always Fenwick hoped that Foster would keep away from him. He did not know what he would not do did he see the man. And then one day, to his amazement, he received a telegram Passing through this way, may I stop with you Monday or Tuesday? Joyles Foster. Uh, Fenwick could scarcely believe his eyes. And then, from curiosity, from cynical contempt, from some deeper, more mysterious motive that he dared not analyze, he had telegraphed, Come. Uh, and here the man was. And he had come, would you believe it? to put things right. He had heard from Hamlin Edis that Fenwick was hurt with him, had some kind of grievance. Oh, I didn't like to feel that, old man, so I just thought I'd stop by and have it out with him, eh? see what the matter was, and put it right, man. Eh? Last night after supper, Foster had tried to put it right. Eagerly, his eyes like a good dog's who is asking for a bone that he knows that he thoroughly deserves, he had held out his hand and asked Fenwick to say what was up. Huh. Fenwick simply had said that nothing was up. Hamanettis was a dead and fool. Oh, I'm glad to hear that then, eh? Foster had cried, springing up out of his chair, putting his hand on Fenwick's shoulder. I'm glad of that, old man. I couldn't bear for us not to be friends. <laughs> We've been friends so long, haven't we? Oh, Lord. How Fenwick hated him at that moment. I say, what a jolly lot of books you have. Forster turned round and looked at Fenwick with eager, gratified eyes. Every book here is interesting. I like your arrangement of them, too. <laughs> and those open bookshelves. It always seems to me a shame to put up books behind glass, man. Forster came forward and sat down quite close to his host. He even reached forward and laid his hand on his host's knee. But look here. I'm mentioning it for the last time, positively. But I do want to make quite certain, eh? There's nothing wrong between us, is there, old man? I know you have matured me last night, but uh, I just want to... Uh. Fenwick looked at him, and surveying him, felt suddenly an exquisite pleasure of hatred. He liked the touch of the man's hand on his knee. He himself bent forward a little, and thinking how agreeable it would be to push Foster's eyes in, deep, deep into his head, crunching them, smashing them to purple, leaving the empty, staring, bloody sockets, simply said, I know. No, 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 of course not. I told you last night. What could there be? 
hand gripped the knee a little more tightly. Oh, I'm so glad. That's splendid. Splendid. <laughs> I hope you won't make me ridiculous. I've, I've always had an affection for you ever since I can remember. I've always wanted to know you better. I've admired your talent so greatly. That novel of yours, the, the, the one about the, um, the aloe? The bitter aloe. Yes, 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 that was it. That was a splendid book, wasn't it? Pessimistic, of course, but still fine, fine. It ought to have done better. I remember thinking so at the time. Yes. Yes, it ought to have done better. Your time will come, though. <laughs> what I say is that good work always tells in the end. <laughs> yes. Yes, my time will come. The thin, piping voice went on. Now, I've had more success than I deserved. <laughs> yes, I have. You can't deny that. Uh, I'm not being falsely modest. I mean it. I've got some talent, of course, but not so much as people say. And you, why, you've got so much more than my, <laughs> than they acknowledge at all. You have, old man. You have indeed. Only I, I do hope you'll forgive me by saying this. Perhaps you haven't advanced quite as you might have done. Living up here, you know, shut away here, closed in by all these mountains in this wet climate, Oof, always raining. Why, you're out of things, old man. You, you don't see people. You don't talk and discover what's really going on. Why, look at me. Then we turned round and looked at him. Now I have half the year in London. Oh, one gets the best of everything. Best talk, best music, best plays. <laughs> And then I'm three months abroad, Italy or Greece or somewhere, and then three months in the country. Oh, now that's an ideal arrangement. You have everything that way. Italy or Greece somewhere. Oh, something turned in Fenwick's breast. Grinding, grinding, grinding. How he had longed, oh, how passionately for just one week in Greece, two days in Sicily. Sometimes he had thought that he might run to it. But when it had come to the actual counting of the pennies, and now this fool, this fat head, this self-satisfied, conceited, patronizing, he got up looking out of the golden sun. A, um, what do you say to a walk? He suggested. The sun will last for a good hour yet. As soon as the words were out of his lips, he felt as though someone else had said them for him. He even turned half round to see whether anyone else were there. Ever since Foster's arrival on the evening before, he had been conscious of this sensation. A walk. Why should he take Foster for a walk, show him his beloved country, point out those curves and lines and hollows, the long silver shield of all's water? The cloudy purple hills hunched like blankets about the knees of some recumbent giant. Why? Why? It was as though he had turned round to someone behind him and said, You have some further design in this, don't you? <sighs> yeah. And the less they started out. The road sank abruptly to the lake, and then the path ran between the trees at the water's edge, across the lake. Tones of bright yellow light, crocus-hued, rode upon the blue. The hills were dark. The very way that Foster walked bespoke the man. He was always a little ahead of you, pushing his long, thin body along with little eager jerks as though he did not hurry. He would miss something that he would be immensely to his advantage. He talked, throwing words over his shoulder to Fenwick as you throw crumbs of bread to a robin. Oh, yes, yeah, of course I was pleased, you know. <laughs> Who would not be? After all, it was a new prize. They've only been awarding it for a year or two. <laughs> but it's gratifying, really gratifying, to secure it. Me! Ah. When I opened the envelope and I found the check there, oh, well, you could have knocked me down with a feather. You could indeed. <laughs> of course, a hundred pounds isn't much, but it's the honor of life to me. Whither were they going? Their destiny was as certain as though they had no free will. Free will? There is no free will. All is fate. Fenwick suddenly laughed aloud. <laughs> Foster stopped. Huh, why, why, what is it? What's what? He laughed. Something amused me. Foster slipped his arm through Fenwick's. 
It is jolly to be walking alone together like this, arm in arm, friends. I'm a sentimental man, I won't deny it. Uh, what I say is that life is short and one must love one's fellow beings. <laughs> oh, where is one? <laughs> oh, you live too much alone, old man. He squeezed Fenwick's arm. That's the truth of it there. It was torture. Exquisite, heavenly torture. It was wonderful to feel that thin, bony arm pressing against his. Almost you could hear the beating of that other heart. Wonderful to feel that arm and the temptation to take it in your two hands and to bend it and twist it and then to hear the bones crack, crack, crack. <sighs> Wonderful to feel that temptation rise through one's body like boiling water and yet not yield to it. For a moment Fenwick's hand touched Foster. Then he drew himself apart. Uh, we're at the village. This is the hotel where they all come in the summer. We turn off at the right here. I'll show you my tarn. Uh, yeah, your tarn, eh? asked Foster. Forgive my ignorance, but what is a tarn exactly? Oh, a tarn is a miniature lake, a pool of water lying in the lap of the hill. Very quiet, lovely, silent. Some of them are immensely deep. Oh, I should like to see that. Yes, it's some little distance, up a rough road. Do you mind? Oh, not a bit. I have long legs. <laughs> uh, some of them are immensely deep, unfathomable. Nobody touched the bottom, but quiet, like glass, with shadows only. Do you know, Fenwick, I've always been afraid of water. I've, I've never learned to swim. I'm afraid to go out of my depth. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah, yeah. But it's all because of my private school. Years ago, when I was a small boy, some big fellow took me, you know, and they held me with my head underwater and nearly drowned me. <laughs> they did indeed. They went further than they meant to. I can, I can see it on their faces. Yeah. Mm. Fenwick considered this. The picture left to his mind. He could see the boys. Large, strong fellows, probably, in this little skinny thing like a frog, their thick hands about his throat, his legs like gray sticks kicking out of the water, their laughter, their sudden sense that something was wrong, the skinny body all flaccid and still. <sighs> he drew a deep breath. Foster was walking beside him now, not ahead of him as though he were a little afraid. And needless reassurance. Indeed, the scene had changed. Before and behind them stretched the uphill path, loose with shale and stones. On the right, on a ridge at the foot of the hill, were some quarries almost deserted, but the more melancholy in the fading afternoon because a little work still continued there. Faint sounds came from the gaunt, listening chimneys. A stream of water ran and tumbled angrily into a pool below. Once and again, a Black silhouette, like a question mark, appeared against the darkening hill. It was a little steep here, and Foster huffed and blew. Fenwick hated him more for that. So thin and spare, and still he could not keep in condition. They stumbled, keeping below the quarry, on the edge of the running water, now green, now a dirty gray-white, pushing their way along the side of the hill. Their faces were set down towards Helvellyn. They rounded the cup of hills, closing in the base and then sprawling to the right. Ah, there's the tarn, Fenwick exclaimed, and then added, The sun's not lasting as long as I had expected. It's growing dark already. Foster stumbled and caught Fenwick's arm. Oh, this, this twilight makes the hills look strange, like living men. I, I, I can scarcely see my way. Oh, we're alone here, Fenwick answered. Don't you feel the stillness? The men will have left the quarry now and gone home. There's no one in all this place but ourselves. If you watch, you'll see a strange green light steal down over the hills. It lasts but for a moment, and then it is dark. Ah, here is my tarn. Do you know how I love this place, Foster? It seems to belong especially to me. 
just as much as all your work and your glory and fame and success seem to belong to you. I have this and you have that. Perhaps in the end we are even after all. Yes. Uh, but I feel as though that piece of water belonged to me and I to it. And as though we should never be separated. Yes. Isn't it black? It is one of the deep ones. No one has ever sounded it. Only Helvellyn knows, and one day I fancy that it will take me, too, into its confidence. Well, whisper its secrets. Achoo! Foster sneezed. Oh, very nice. Uh, it's very beautiful, Fenwick. Uh, I like your tower, and it's uh, charming and all. Uh, and now let's turn back. Uh, it is a difficult walk beneath the quarry. It, it's chilly here, too. Do you see that little jetty there? Fenwick led Foster by the arm. Someone built that out into the water. He had a boat there, I suppose. Come and look down. From the end of the little jetty, it looks so deep, and the mountains seem to close round. Fenwick took Foster's arm and led him to the end of the jetty. Indeed, the water looked deep here. Deep and very black. Foster peered down. Then he looked up at the hills that did indeed seem to have gathered close around him. And he sneezed again. Uh, oh dear, I've caught a cold, I'm afraid. Let's turn home, Lord Fenwick. We shall never find our way. Ah, home then, said Fenwick. And his hands closed about that thin, scraggy neck. For the instant the head half turned and two startled, strangely childish eyes stared. And then with a push that was ludicrously simple, the body was impelled forward. There was a sharp cry, ah! a splash, a stir of something white against the swiftly gathering dusk again and then again and far spreading ripples. And then silence. The silence extended. Having unwrapped the tarn, it spread as though with finger on lip to the already quiescent hills. Fenwick shared in the silence. He luxuriated in it. He did not move at all. He stood there, looking upon the inky water of the tarn, his arms folded, a man lost in intensest thought. But he was not thinking. He was only conscious of a warm, luxurious relief a sensuous feeling that was not thought at all. Foster was gone. That tiresome, prating, conceited, self-satisfied fool. Gone, never to return. The tarn assured him of that. He stared back into Fenwick's face, approvingly, as though it said, You have done well, a clean and necessary job. We have done it together, you and I. I am proud of you. <laughs> and he was proud of himself. At last he had done something definite with his life. Thought, eager, active thought, was beginning now to flood his brain. For all these years he had hung around in this place doing nothing but cherish grievances, weak and backboneless. Now at last there was action. He drew himself up and he looked at the hills. He was proud. And he was cold. He was shivering. He turned up the collar of his coat. Yes, there was the faint green light that always lingered in the shadows of the hills for a brief moment before darkness came. It was growing late. He had better return. Shivering now, so that his teeth chattered, he started off down the path, and then was aware that he did not wish to leave the tarn. The tarn was friendly. The only friend he had in all the world. As he stumbled along in the dark, his sense of loneliness grew. He was going home to an empty house. There had been a guest in it last night. Who was it? Uh, why, Foster, of course. Foster, with his silly laugh and amiable, mediocre eyes. Well, Foster would not be there now. No, Foster would never be there again. 
and suddenly Fenwick started to run. He did not know why, except that now that he had left the tarn, he was lonely. He wished that he could have stayed there all night, but because he was cold, he could not, and now he is running so that he might be at home with lights and familiar furniture and all the things that he knew to reassure him. As he ran, the shale and stones scattered beneath his feet. They made a tit-tattering noise under him, and, and someone else seemed to be running, too. He stopped, and the other runner also stopped. He breathed in the silence. He was hot now. The perspiration was trickling down his cheeks. He could feel a dribble of it down his back inside his shirt. His knees were pounding, his heart was thumping, and, and all around him the hills were so amazingly silent. Now like India rubber clouds that you could push in or pull out as you do those India rubber faces, gray against the night sky of a crystal purple upon whose surface, like twinkling eyes of boats at sea, stars were now appearing. His knees steadied, his heart beat less fiercely, and he began to run again. Suddenly he had turned the corner and was out at the hotel. Its lamps were kindly and reassuring. He walked then quietly along the lakeside path, and had it not been for the certainty that someone was treading behind him, he would have been comfortable and at his ease. He stopped once or twice and looked back, and once he stopped and called out, Who's there? Who? Who's there? Only the rustling trees answered. He had the strangest fancy, but his brain was throbbing so fiercely that he could not think that it was the tarn that was following him. The tarn, slipping, sliding along the road, being with him so that he should not be lonely. He could almost hear the tarn whisper in his ear, We did that together, and so I do not wish you to bear all the responsibility yourself. I will stay with you, so that you are not lonely. He climbed the road towards home, and there were the lights of his house. He heard the gate click behind him as though it were shutting him in. He went into the sitting room, lighted and ready. Yes, there were the books the foster had admired. The old woman who looked after him appeared. Will you be having some tea, sir? Uh, no, thank you, Annie. Uh, will the other gentleman be wanting any? No, no, the... Other gentleman is away for the night. Uh, then there will be only one for supper, sir. Yes, only one for supper. He sat in the corner of the sofa and fell instantly into a deep slumber. He woke when the old woman tapped him on the shoulder and told him the supper was served. The room was dark save for the jumping light of two uncertain candles. Those two red candlesticks... <laughs> how he hated them up there on the mantelpiece. He had always hated them, and now they seemed to him to have something of the quality of Foster's voice, that thin, reedy, piping tone. <sighs> he was expecting at every moment that Foster would enter, and yet he knew that he would not. He continued to turn his head towards the door, but it was so dark there that you could not see. The whole room was dark, except just there by the fireplace, where the two candlesticks went whining with their miserable, twinkling plaint. He went into the dining room and sat down to his meal, but he could not eat anything. It was odd. The place by the table where Foster's chair should be, odd, naked, it made a man feel lonely. He got up once from the table, went to the window, opened it and looked out. He listened for something. A trickle as of running water stirred through the silence as though some deep pool were filling to the brim. A rustle in the trees, perhaps. An owl hooted. Sharply, as though someone had spoken to him unexpectedly behind his shoulder, he closed the window and looked back, peering under his dark eyebrows into the room. Later on, he went up to bed. Had he been sleeping? I had been lying lazily as one does, half dozing, half luxuriously, not thinking. He was wide awake now, utterly awake, and his heart was beating with apprehension. It was as though someone had called him by name. He slept always with his window a little open and the blind up. 
Tonight the moonlight shadowed in sickly fashion the objects in his room. It was not a flood of light, nor yet a sharp splash, silvering a square, a circle, throwing the rest into ebony blackness. The light was dim, a little green, perhaps, like the shadow that comes over the hills just before dark. He stared at the window, and it seemed to him that something, something moved there, within or rather against the green-gray light. Something silver-tinted glistened. Fenwick stared. It had the look exactly of slipping water. Ha! Huh. Slipping water. He listened, his head up, and it seemed to him that from beyond that window he caught a stir of water, not running, but rather welling up and up, gurgling with satisfaction as it filled and filled. He sat up higher in bed. Then he saw that down the wallpaper beneath the window water was undoubtedly trickling. He could see it lurch to the projecting wood of the sill, pause, and then slip, slither down the incline. The odd thing was that it fell so silently. Beyond the window there was that odd gurgle, but in the room itself absolute silence. Whence could it come? He saw the line of silver rise and fall as the stream on the window ledge ebbed and flowed. He must get up and close the window. He drew his legs above the sheets and blankets and looked down. He looked down and shrieked. The floor was covered with a shining film of water. It was rising. As he looked, it had covered half the short, stumpy legs of the bed. It rose without a wink, a bubble, a break. Over the sill it poured now in a steady flow, but soundless. Fenwick sat back in the bed, the clothes gathered to his chin, his eyes blinking, the Adam's apple throbbing like a throttle in his throat. But he must do something. He must stop this. The water was now level with the seats of the chairs, but still was soundless. Could he but reach the door? He put down his naked foot, then cried again. The water was icy cold. Suddenly... Leaning, staring at its dark, unbroken sheen, something seemed to push him forward. He fell. His head, his face was under the icy liquid. It seemed adhesive, and in the heart of its ice, hot like melting wax. He struggled to his feet. The water was breast high. He screamed again and again. He could see the looking-glass, the row of books, the picture of Durer's horse, aloof, impervious. He beat at the water, and flakes of it seemed to cling to him like scales of fish clammy to his touch. He struggled, plowing his way towards the door. The water now was at his neck. Then something had caught him by the ankle. Something held him. He struggled, crying, Let me go! Let me go! I tell you to let me go! I hate you! I hate you! I will not come down to you! I will not! The water covered his mouth. He felt as someone pushed in his eyeballs with his bare knuckles. A cold hand reached up and caught his naked thigh. In the morning, the little maid knocked, and receiving no answer, came in, as was her wont, with his shaving water. What she saw made her scream. She ran for the gardener. They took the body with its staring, protruding eyes, its tongue sticking out between the clenched teeth, and laid it on the bed. The only sign of disorder was an overturned water jug. A small pool of water stained the carpet. It was a lovely morning. A twig of ivy idly in the little breeze tapped on the pane. You've just heard tonight's story from Storylink Radio's Countdown to Halloween 2022. Remember to come back for our next tale. Many more stories of all genres available to listen to and read along with now on our website at www.storylinkradio.com. Visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash storylinkradio. And visit our podcast for easy mobile listening anywhere, anytime. Just search for StoryLink Radio on your favorite podcast provider.
Oh, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click that alert bell for Story Link Radio.